<laughs> we are less than without you. And so with that, friends, we're going to begin and welcome to our 48th online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. This time is called Being Church, and it is sponsored by ELCA's coaching ministry. I'm Jill Beverlin. I am the National Coordinator of Coaching for the ELCA and one of your facilitators today. It's important for us to be reminded that this time is meant to be a safe and brave space for the people of our church to bring the truth of who they are and how they are doing. These conversations are an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. So as we open today, I offer you two texts from scripture. From the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Thank you for joining us today. Last week, we gathered in the afterglow of the inauguration. And this week, we are riding that wonderful wave of fresh opportunity. And with this, we welcome to the room Garrett Savage. Garrett is an award-winning film producer that is committed to bringing the truth to light in order to bring the best and brightest light into our world. Along with our esteemed guests, we welcome Sarah Jackson, founder of Casa de Paz. You may remember her from early September when she was our guest speaker and Giovanna Oaxaca, Program Director for Immigration Policy for the ELCA. Garrett, thank you for being with us today. I know that you may have brought other folks with you, so please introduce them when it fits for you. We look forward to learning more about immigration policy through your message and what we might do in this time to positively impact what's happening in our country. Garrett, welcome to our space. Thank you, Jill. Uh, thanks for having me in your space. Hello, everybody. Thanks for calling in today. I know you're busy. You have a lot of other things to do. So it really means a lot that you're tuning in here to see the, the film that we made uh, about Sarah and Casa de Paz. And uh, we're really excited to share it to you, share it with you. And um, I hope that you'll find it as inspiring as, as we did when we first met Sarah and Oliver, who's the lead host at Casa de Paz. So, um, I don't think I need to say too much more. Uh, I'll be back after we watch the film to answer any questions you may have. And, um, and I look forward to it. Thank you. So friends, welcome back. Feel free to turn your cameras back on now. You just witnessed some of the most um, precious work that happens in our kingdom. And you witnessed the very sacred space of Casa de Paz. Garrett, please help us unpack what we just saw because I seriously can't talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to unpack it? I'm crying seeing people crying. This is amazing. We usually do these as a webinar and um, we come back and I see four squares and and I don't get to see you all. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of the, things I miss about uh, not being able to show the film in person at a festival or a gathering, a community organization or a church um, in times of COVID. And, and it, it's, uh, so now I'm crying because of this, this simulated connection that we all are having now in, instead of the actual in person. Although I know this is a group from all over the country. So in some ways we're blessed by technology, right? That we can get together and share the story and, and um, share this moment of, of um, understanding and uh, compassion with each other. So there's pluses and minuses to, uh, to everything, including COVID and technology. Um, unpack, uh, I really think the film speaks for itself in so many ways. Um, you know, sometimes people ask us, uh, my wife is the director, I'm the producer, um, and they say, how did you find this story? So maybe I'll start there. Um, we live in Boulder, Colorado. As you saw, uh, Sarah and Casa de Paz are in Denver. Um, my wife's mother uh, is in Denver and she heard about Casa de Paz and went to a training session. And that was the summer of 2018. 
when uh, parents were being separated from their children uh, at the border. And uh, she went to a training meeting uh, for volunteers for Casa de Paz and was uh, moved and inspired. Um, and she told us about it. And uh, my wife went down and I don't remember Sarah, she, she didn't do a volunteer training, but she, she talked to Sarah and arranged a meeting and, um, and they met and, uh, you know, Dia loved meeting Sarah and hearing about what they were doing and came back and just said, we have to tell this story in a film. And uh, I, I, I could see that I could see in my wife that she was, like I say, inspired. It's a word that comes up a lot in the story. And I said, let's do it. We'd never made a movie to be, together before. So that was a new thing for us. It ended up going very well. Um, and and uh, we got to know Sarah and Oliver better and scheduled a three-day shoot in December of 2019. 2019, yeah, 2019. And, um, and then we did a day in January and we weren't sure if we had enough for a film and we hired an editor to help us figure that out. And she looked at it and uh, give a lot of credit to our editor to help us figure out that we did have enough for the film that you saw. Um, and it's just been wonderful to stay friends with Sarah and Oliver. And uh, we got to travel to one film festival in last January, a year ago now. Uh, before COVID shut everything down. Um, but uh, one of the great things that's come out of this is I feel like I have a new friend in Sarah. And, uh, gosh, I don't know, you guys got me all emotional today, <laughs> uh, which is good, right? Um, and so Sarah and I work closely on getting this movie and out into the world and uh, getting the story of what she does to new audiences. So part of why I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Yeah. So Garrett, that's an amazing story. Um, so many things stand out for me. It's almost, I'm like you, like, okay, where to begin? And I'm sure that everybody that's logged onto the call has that same thought and wants to ask you a million things. Um, just uh, to lighten the mood for one second, I wanna give you and Dia credit for um, making this film together. They say that couples should never wallpaper together and maybe that same thing applies to making movies together. But here you are, you're still a couple, you did it. And so that's, that's fantastic. Um, extra positive energy from, the, from the, um, the production of that together. So uh, how would you feel, Garrett, about just fielding a few questions from our, our group? And, and Sarah, you too, uh, I've seen this twice now. Um, I was even more emotional this time and I didn't think that was possible, but I kept thinking, I have to speak after this, so hold it together. <laughs> and um, yeah, so friends, if you have questions for, for Garrett or for Sarah right now, um, why don't a few of you unmute? And we do wanna give you small group time to kind of unpack because just as you are seeing Garrett and I be emotional about this, um, we wanna give you guys, uh, all of you a chance to unpack the emotion that you're feeling and and as is our habit talk about what's a faithful step you can take from hearing this some of you come from sanctuary congregations what would it look like to connect to a casa and figure out how can we complement the good work that we're doing um, maybe you know that you are located near a detention center and there is not a casa near you what does that conversation look like so um friends someone please unmute and ask our first question I have a question in terms of, um, I believe, um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry, my computer was saying I was muted. Um, it sounded like if I heard correctly on the, the movie that this is a, um, just a temporary shelter. It provides um, housing supplies for people for the first couple of days. And so I was curious how, um, if it was explored or um, if anyone knows how, uh, like what happens once, once those immigrants leave uh, Casa de Paz, you know, is there help in, <clears throat> in finding them additional resources and housing elsewhere, or um, is it just giving them a couple of days to kind of figure that out on their own? I was just curious as to that process. Sarah, do you want to take that? Sure. Thanks for your question, Emily. That's a question um, that's really important to ask because 
the majority of folks leaving immigrant detention centers have family or they have friends or they have a sponsor somewhere in the United States that they're trying to get to. So most of the folks that we see who have just been released from the detention center are going somewhere else. They don't want to make Denver their home. <laughs> um, you know, they, uh, they've got a family in Florida that they're headed to, or their sponsor lives in Minnesota, right? So the, the majority of the uh, guests that pass through the CASA is just a very temporary thing. Oh, so um, CASA de Paz isn't offering sponsorship so much as just a place kind of in between detention and their sponsor. Yep, yep. Oh, okay. And one of our volunteers, Denise, actually saw that gap, that there was no sponsorship program here in Denver. She started volunteering with us. She started visiting folks in the detention center and realized, well, what if somebody doesn't have a sponsor? What if they don't have any connections to the United States? And so she started a program where folks can actually sponsor someone in the detention center and then come alongside them with the long-term care that they may need. So longer term housing, figuring out how to use the buses, where to go for ESL, where's the local market with food that they like. Um, so that sort of addresses that gap where somebody in the detention center does not have a sponsor. Now there is another aspect of this to keep layering on top, which is that sometimes immigrants are released from the detention center. They don't have a sponsor. They don't have family or friends. And this is just where they happen to get transferred to Denver, Colorado and then they're released and then boom, this is their new home, what do they do? So there are a variety of different nonprofits already here in Denver that resettle refugees and asylum seekers that we can then, we've got really good relationships with them. So then we can make that connection uh, and then they can take it over from there. And I think that's one of the reasons that at least in my humble opinion or never to be humble opinion as my mom says, uh, why we've been able to do what we do so well is because we're staying really in our lane. And then we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel and create our own sponsorship program or our own long-term resettlement program. We just find the people that are already experts in it and work alongside them. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. In fact, one of the gentlemen that was released a couple years ago, his name is Gudiel. Uh, he is an asylum seeker from Central America, came to the United States, presented himself lawfully at the border, was arrested by ICE, then transferred over here to Denver, and was released after winning his case. And we were able to connect him to the uh, Lutheran Family Services, who now has gotten him an apartment, he has a job. And this past holiday season, we did our Hope for the Holidays program, where we make cards for folks who are locked up in the detention center. And Gudiel made over 100 handmade cards, along with little packages of Christmas cookies to give to the folks who are locked up. So it's always nice when we can keep those long-term relationships with our guests. Wonderful. Where's another question from our group? That was a question. Yeah, um, I was wondering, um, I, it looked like in the film that, that one of them, there was, there was a lawyer there or something, or, or at least someone who knew kind of the laws or whatever. Do you help connect them with, with people in, you know, lawyers, people like that, that can help them with their case and, and that kind of thing? Yes, so there is another nonprofit here in town called the Rocky Mountain Immigrants and Advocacy Network, or REMAIN for short, and their focus is to help folks remain in the country when they're here. And so they coordinate the pro bono program within the detention center. And another layer, there's a gap there too, because there aren't enough pro bono lawyers to take all the cases. And when you're locked up in an immigrant detention center, you have not committed a crime, you're not serving a time, you know, a sentence for a crime that you've committed. So you actually, 
if you had committed a crime, you would qualify for a, 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 an attorney, a defense attorney, but you haven't. So you, you don't get access to free legal representation. And so Remain isn't able to take everyone through their program. And one of our, another one of our volunteers, Greg, started a legal defense fund to raise money to uh, provide legal representation for folks that don't qualify for remain, but are still locked in detention. And actually their very first person that they raised money for, his name is Omar and he was from a small country in Africa and they represented him and he ended up winning his case. And this puts the spotlight on the need for legal representation uh, because most folks that are locked up in that detention center here in Aurora and across the country, uh, you know, I, Garrett, you saw a number like 62%. I've seen numbers closer to 80% of folks that are locked up do not have legal representation. And the, the, the only one of the main differences of why somebody may win an asylum case and somebody may lose their asylum case is if they have legal representation. Um, the, I think it's something that I heard was like over 90% of the people that actually get a lawyer to help represent them will be successful. Whereas if you don't have a lawyer, your chances are slim to none. I presume there are people in Denver that don't approve or agree with what you're doing. What kind of pressure or reactions have you felt from them? Yeah, uh, a, a lot of different reactions, everything from just snide comments on social media to literal death threats. I've had people threaten to blow me up or hunt me down, um, which is interesting because, um, you know, when I grew up uh, as a young child, I served at a soup kitchen and I fed people who were homeless and I never got a death threat for feeding people who were homeless. Uh, but then all of a sudden you add the word immigrant in the conversation and boom, things change. So, you know, the first death threat I had shook me up a little bit, uh, but then at the same breath, I was I almost felt a little bit proud because as a follower of Jesus, he was also killed for standing up for what he believed in. And no, I'm not saying that I want to die, but I've lived a very good life. And if that's the price that I pay, that's the price that I pay. That doesn't mean that I'm dumb and I just kind of willy nilly do what, you know, I don't take any safety precautions. So, you know, we do simple things like we don't have our address listed anywhere publicly. We make sure that all of our volunteers have gone through a, a vetting process before they find out where the location of our home is. We don't have any signage at our home so that if you were just to drive past it, you wouldn't know that it was a home, you know, providing shelter for newly arrived immigrants. Uh, but I actually think that there's a, a silver lining to that because when guests arrive at our home, or sometimes volunteers or whatever the case is, uh, they'll, they'll walk in and I, some of them are sort of expecting like a, a facility kind of feel to it, a little bit more sterile or industrial, but we're a home. I mean, you saw inside of that house, I, the interview that I gave, I was on my bed. Uh, and I think that folks feel a lot more comfortable when we, when we say like my home is your home. Like we live here. This is our home too, you know, you, and we're just sharing it with you for a short time. So I think some of those safety things like not having a sign on there and not making it look like a facility is actually even more welcoming for our guests. I, I wanna Do you ever run into um, zoning issues? No, and that's partially because our lease, we're renting from a, a gentleman who owns a home. In our lease, it says we can have up to 10 guests that are not on the lease for up to three nights at a time. So it's operating more sort of like an Airbnb style um, than, than a true homeless shelter. Uh, and I, I was inspired actually a few years ago, I saw that there was a, a person in New York City who shared his apartment with refugees who had just newly arrived and he was running into zoning issues and then he thought well I'll just do Airbnb and then I'll charge them you know I think you have to charge at least ten dollars a night well he covered the cost for it but you know there's creative ways to work around that. <laughs> Sarah can you talk about, talk about your plans for uh, like you mentioned you are leasing renting 
current CASA, what are your future plans for permanence? Yeah, so we are going to purchase three homes. And one home is going to be where all of our guests stay, which is wonderful uh, to have a, a permanent location that is fully paid for. And then either on the same block or, it, you know, if it's a, a condo kind of style or townhome style, uh, right next door will be a living space for the host family. So in this video or in this movie, you saw that it was Oliver and Mirabelle and Kylie who live at the Casa, but we want to provide a, a separate living space with some more privacy for the main host family that lives on site. And then in addition, another living quarters for somebody who is the executive director, who's kind of steering the ship to where it needs to go. Um, so far, we've been now open almost nine years and we don't have any paid staff. We've done this all volunteer based and in exchange for rent, we offer our time. And, um, and I think that that's just a, a way that we can ensure that at the end of the day, whether nobody ever gives another penny as a donation to keep our doors open or through our social enterprise, Volleyball Internacional, nobody chooses to play and there's no income coming that way. We can still do what we do because we've got the property fully paid for. So that's the long-term goal. We're really, really, really close. Uh, depending on how the housing market is this year or next year, it looks like we could probably accomplish our goal to buy those in cash. I've never been in debt with uh, the CASA and I don't ever want to take it to that place. So we're just saving and we have the cash. We're going to look at those three homes and we'll say, here's the check. Those are now our homes. <laughs> you briefly mentioned Volleyball Internacional. Can you uh, tell the folks what that is? Yeah. So I started the CASA and about six months after I opened up the doors of the home, I already ran out of all my money. I didn't have a lot of money. I'm not going to act like I did, but I had a little bit of money in my savings. And there came a, a day where I had, I remember laughing. I had three pennies. I didn't even have a nickel and rent was coming up. And I'm like, how am I going to pay for rent? Like, I don't know how to do this because we were having more and more people stay with us. I was spending more money on food and the electricity bill was higher. And so I, at a certain point, just wanted to quit because I knew I couldn't pay my bills. And thankfully at the time, a friend of mine encouraged me not to quit and to find a way to make some money. And uh, he asked me, what else do you love to do? Obviously you care about putting families back together again, but what else do you like to do? And I said, volleyball, I love playing volleyball. And he said, well, start a volleyball league and charge people to play in the volleyball league. And then at the end of the season, whatever profit you've made, then just donate it to the CASA and you can pay your bills. So I, um, I, I took his advice. I started a volleyball league. And right now, because of COVID, we're not playing. But typically, in any given season, as we've grown, we have anywhere between 60 and 80 teams registered each season. And all of our players know where their registration fees are going, right? So we get on the court, and we want to have fun and be competitive and de-stress after a long days of work. But when we put our feet on that volleyball court, we also know we're playing to keep families together again. Friends, I appreciate all of the questions that are coming and the large group discussion. One of the things that we are committed to is providing a small group opportunity. So you too can um, just express how this has moved you. And in fact, Garrett's um, team has a a study guide and some suggested questions to help unpack the, the the movie. And Garrett, if I'm not mistaken, that first question is, what part of the movie moved you most and why? So that's one question that I encourage you to take to the breakout room. Um, the other thing, again, that we ask that you consider is, what is your most faithful step related to this topic of immigration? Maybe it is to make a donation to CASA. Maybe it's to explore opening up a CASA. Um, in your community. Um, maybe it's to attach your gifts to one of those gap areas that, that Garrett, Garrett and Sarah helped identify. Um, maybe it's making a commitment to come back in March when Gio will be our guest speaker to talk about um, how the ELCA specifically is relating to the area of immigration policy and how we can positively affect that. So friends, we're going to um, send you to the breakout rooms and bring you back um, just a little before the hour to unpack some additional learnings and um, yeah, talk about our next steps. So have a blessed conversation.
person and I almost fell over. Like, what? How does that happen? But yeah, it was a very cool experience. So friends, welcome back to our space. Oh, okay. Now we're all back. Okay. So a second welcome back to our space. Um, hope that you had inspiring conversation following that very impactful film. So as a way of surfacing themes and learnings, I invite each of you to put in the chat area just what's something that came out of your conversation that you're going to carry with you this week. And while you are doing that, if our, um, yeah, Garrett's still on with us. I know that Sarah has another meeting. Um, Garrett, and if Sarah is still with us, I invite you to just share a few final comments while people are sharing in the chat room what, what themes surfaced in their conversations, what they've learned, and what they're going to carry with them this week. A question that I had in our group, is there a mechanism to um, offer congregational or individual sponsorships of CASA? Wow. Sponsorships in what way? Like, are we talking sponsoring someone in the detention center? That's what my mind runs to when I hear that. No. Um, being a sustainer of CASA, saying oh. I'm going to be a monthly giver or, um, you know, those kinds of mechanisms. Absolutely. Yes. And I think that's just one aspect of getting your congregation involved. I actually used to work at a software company where we would help churches engage their members better. And the three metrics that we use to, to measure engagement were, are they attending, are they serving, and are they giving? So giving is, I think, just one aspect, but, um, and so I'm going to put in here a link if you would like to make a donation, uh, but I'm also very eager to have conversations with, um, with congregations on how they can also engage, maybe becoming a pen pal with someone who's locked up in the detention center, uh, taking that next step and going even a little bit deeper. So uh, I put the link to donate in there, and then I'm also going to just put my email address in here. Like Jill mentioned, unfortunately, I do have to head out in a few minutes, but if y'all have uh, would like to continue the conversation, I'm, I'm all for that. And you can also contact us if you need Sarah's information and we'll make sure you, to put you in touch. Wonderful, and Garrett, related to that, um, Rob asked a really great question. What if a congregational representative that's on this call right now would like to host uh, a viewing of this documentary, just like we did today, what would their next step be? Very easy. I'm going to I'm going to post a link. It's on our website uh, screening request. And um, we can license the film to a group to show it to their members. Um, and uh, we've been we've got 12 scheduled the first three months of the year and we're booking more every week. Um, so we're really excited to do that. And um, if you fill that form out, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And for those who can't access the chat, I'll make sure that is included with the recording as well. Okay, our website is welcomestrangersfilm.com. Welcomestrangersfilm.com. Janice asks, uh, what is the cost for a showing? Um, we we wanna work with people. We wanna get the film out. So we'll start a conversation with you to find out what your budget is, if you have a budget, uh, how many people you might be showing it to, et cetera. And uh, yeah, we wanna get the film out there. You all are asking great questions. And so Garrett and Sarah, I'm gonna put you on the spot one last time here before we do our final wrap up. What has brought you hope from gathering with us today? I'll let Sarah go first and she's gotta go. Thanks Garrett. Um, I think and this is like so selfish, but somebody in my breakout uh, session asked, how do I stay healthy through all of this? And how do I uh, take care of my heart? And I said, you know what, I do things that I that make me happy. I sleep in and I get food delivered and I go on walks every day and I spend time with my family and I make sure that I have time to enjoy life. And I said that I think the God that I, that I believe in wants us to enjoy life and also wants us to create a world where other folks enjoy their lives as well. Uh, going back to the verse to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And that, that 
that uh, we we have to love ourselves in order to sh uh, to show that kind of love that's in our scripture that we're told to share. And so I I felt encouraged and hopeful that um, that we do things to take care of ourselves. We do things to take care of each other's uh, people. I think that Mother Teresa said, if we have no peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to each other and we belong to each other, right? I belong to you, you belong to me. And to see, like Garrett said, to see people's faces today and have this conversation has given me a lot of hope. Wonderful, thank you for that beautiful, um, you just phrase everything so beautifully, Sarah. Um, thank you for being with us. God bless your next conversation. We appreciate your time. Yeah, Garrett, how about you? What has brought you hope today? Uh, as I said, seeing seeing all your faces, uh, seeing that you're interested, attentive, um, and knowing what I know about uh, ELCA and, and from having spoken to Jill and Jason about your mission and your events that happen here at this time uh, every Wednesday and... Um, uh, I'm not somebody who, uh, I don't go to church. Um, I grew up in the church, um, but I don't have a personal experience with it in my life now. Um, other than actually, other than my dad, who, um, is somebody who, when he saw this film, his takeaway was, that's interesting. Um, and he couldn't see past his preconceptions that these were illegal people. And um, so that's been my experience of a certain type of Christian for many years. And that's not the vibe I'm getting here. And uh, it's really nice to be amongst you. And um, it started with Sarah. And uh, I hope you take this the right way. But while we were making the film, um, my wife and I turned to each other and we said, gosh, we're making a film about good Christians. And uh, that's not what we set out to do. We set out to make a film about Sarah and Oliver and Casa de Paz. And um, I'm happy to have a, a, a work in the world that's, that's celebrating uh, the good work that Christians do. And, uh, and I, I, I see you here today for this hour. And so that's, that's given me hope. So friends, I hope that Garrett's words bring you hope. They also bring a very big challenge to us growing into that identity. Um, one of the reasons why ELCA Coaching Ministry hosted this, invited Garrett and Sarah into this space is that one of our visions is that as we have coaching conversations, that people would grow to see, name, and act as if they really were beloved of God, gifted by God, and invited by God into God's work of loving and healing the world. The work of CASA is definitely doing that. Um, Garrett, thank you so much for this time. God bless you as you continue to do this work alongside Sarah. Um, friends, I want to hear your stories. As you are enacting this stuff and sharing this film, um, please, please let Jason and I know what's happening and how this has impacted you personally, your community, um, and what great next faithful steps you are taking. Um, our friend, um, Deacon Tammy Devine, is going to share a final blessing with us. And those of you that want to stay on for even more conversation, Tammy's going to keep um, the room open for you. So thank you, friends. God bless you. Um, Reverend Sylvain Nielsen Gooden is with us again next week, um, continuing our conversation around grief, which is an important thing for us to continue to work on together as well. So Tammy, thank you. The Lord be with you. Good and gracious God, you smile upon the wide diversity and beauty in humanity, the humanity in which you have created it. Help, but you weep at the great divide. Awaken us each day to the gratitude for all that we so easily take for granted. Let our eyes be, do more than just read the stories in the daily paper or watch them on the evening news. Let our eyes take those stories to our hearts where we are one with all who dwell on the earth. Touch our compassion so that we know the pain 
of all those who are oppressed, separated, detained, and struggling with burdens. Compassionate Creator, stir our souls. Call us again and again to be true children of the universe. May we be attentive and alert to how you would have us live life abundantly. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Keep shining that light of Christ. I see it shining very brightly this day. God bless you. See you next week. Thanks again, Garrett. Thank you.